Welcome to Spot Check, the weekly video update series for The Greatest Unreality, a dissertation about Dungeons & Dragons. The Kickstarter has now funded, so I will be talking much less about it in these opening introductions, but I do want to say thank you to everyone who backed the project, helped spread the word, or just sent me encouraging notes uh, through the messaging system on Kickstarter. It's all been very encouraging, and I'm hitting the ground running, leaving for New York next week to do a research trip, and got some good interviews lined up that I'll be talking about in the future. I will continue doing the Spot Check series as I'm in New York and I'm doing various field work, but because it's part of the Kickstarter itself and is one of the rewards for the backers, I'm waiting to hear back from the backers on how they want me to handle that. So if you're not a backer, there is a chance that I won't be releasing the videos publicly anymore or that there may be a delay after uh, between when the backers see them and when I'm able to release them online. And that's entirely their prerogative, of course. So last week we talked about how over time people began to change their ideas about what kind of story they wanted to get out of gaming and how they wanted to produce that story. The iconic product in this shift is Dragonlance, which is a series of linked adventure modules and, and novels. And specifically, uh, they are quest fantasy novels in a long typographic plot arc like we talked about. So with these modules, as the designers would later explain, they were doing something that no game company had ever attempted before, at least according to them, producing game modules with a connecting storyline and characters that would carry over from one module to the next, growing in all aspects of their lives. So you can see also the idea of a thick literary characterization as opposed to the more iconic characterization that you would tend to find in traditional oral storytelling like folklore and mythology. And reactions to Dragonlance were in some ways mixed. It was a very, very popular move and they made a lot of money off of it and moved a lot of products. But in the intervening years, people have started to reflect on their experiences of moving towards that more literary mode of storytelling. And uh, in some of the cases, the people that I've talked to claim that they, their experience in playing D&D actually worsened the more they became worried about producing a, an ambitious literary story out of the game. And so... In some cases, this has led to people taking apart the, the assumptions of D&D and trying to build games that better produce those literary typographic plot arcs. In other cases, it's, gone, it's caused people to go back and look at those basic assumptions of what, what kind of story Dungeons & Dragons is able to produce or other similar old-school games. So we talked about how the Dungeons & Dragons is built on a, the more of a pulp fantasy origin, and also how the embracing of contingency in the game put it, puts it at a midway point between narrativization in everyday life and the uh, sort of uh, storytelling that a traditional author or playwright or screenwriter would have where they have complete control over the story. So what I want to look at today is how does embracing contingency in these earlier games change the way that story is produced? So first, what does that look like, embracing contingency? First, the, uh, the dungeon master will tend to have little or sometimes no particular narrative prepared in advance. Just a sketch of what exists in the world, and then you wait for the characters to interact with that, and then through that process, you create a narrative that neither the dungeon master nor the player could have predicted. It also means using random chance to fill in gaps in that sketch prepared. Uh, as oh, when I was talking to Tavis, he talked about when he's running a game, it, he'll be like, oh, what's over that next hill? I don't know. Let's roll and find out and see what happens and go from there and see what story is produced out of those random events. And in my observations of gaming sessions of gamers who uh, embrace this idea of contingency, what I see is that in actual practice, it becomes a combination of that random generation and also spur-of-the-moment improvisation. They're not completely dependent on the dice, they, and the dice need to be interpreted. And then third, incorporation of player ideas. If a player mentions something, a lot of the DMs I mentioned would kind of work that into the events that were slowly being interpreted as the random generation occurred. By embracing the contingent and watching that process of mythologization unfold in the game, just like we talked about how stories help to lay bare the mythic that we experience in everyday life, in embracing the role of chance in D&D, &D, that can help to lay bare the process by which the mythic emerges from seemingly random details. 
which can train the players to take active roles in making sense of events beyond their control. In everyday life, we have random things happen to us that don't seem to make any sense. And so by including those in the game, uh, you're modeling in some ways an aspect of reality. Third, random determination can free the player to better pursue creativity. Research by cognitive psychologists such as Fink and Ward suggests an empirical basis to the proverb that necessity is the mother of invention. In testing the effects of constraints on creativity, they found that any method that restricts, restricts the general category or function of an object would improve the creative potential of a given technique for producing creative content. So by creating random events, you're creating parameters in which you have to interpret and be creative, which can spur further creativity. And then lastly, embracing contingency encourages an active stance towards chance events. Now, uh, old school gaming is sometimes viewed as a passive activity where things just happen to the characters. But if you look at what's happening in the relationship between contingency and mythologization, you see that you have to take a very active role to make sense of these random events. And in this way, the position of an old school gamer is similar to uh, something described by William James. And I'm going to end with a, this quotation from him, which I think summarizes the old school gamer's position in relationship to contingency quite well. We stand on a mountain pass in the midst of whirling snow and blinding mist, through which we get glimpses now and then of paths which may be deceptive. If we stand still, we shall be frozen to death. If we take the wrong road, we shall be dashed to pieces. We do not certainly know whether there is any right one. What must we do? Be strong and of a good courage. Act for the best, hope for the best, and take what comes. If death ends all, we cannot meet death better.